would you please open your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. I just learned this past week that Ancestry.com, if you're not familiar with Ancestry.com, you can go on there and I think they offer some free trials. Uh, I've known some people who have gotten into it through their free trial and then got hooked, you know, when you sign up for a free trial and then you forget to cancel it. That happened to them one time, I believe. Um, but they, you can go in there and you can trace your lineage. You can follow back in family history. You can try to connect where your mom, your dad, uh, you know, where their family lines go and find in history things about your family. Genealogies, um, because of this, it proves to be important to people. They want to know where they've come from. They want to know uh, what are some things that their ancestors have done or achieved. Sometimes if they find people in their line, in their lineage, that have done something great, it actually seems to give them a sense of pride, a sense of worth, a sense of importance. At the same time, if you were to find out that someone in your past, an ancestor, did some horrible thing, some horrible crime or some big evil, it would probably bring a sense of embarrassment to you to be linked with that person. Well, because of this, because people are so curious and interested in their lineage and their genealogies and their ancestors, Ancestry.com last year in, in 2021 made $1 billion in revenue. So that just shows that people are very interested in this, right? People want to know. It's important to people to know their genealogy, to know what generations have come before them. Well, throughout the Bible, you get the same kind of list of genealogies, of generations. You know, this person was the father of this person. And sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves in our Bible reading plan, that's usually where we get stuck, right? It's hard to find interest in that. Um, but when it comes to our family history, it's a little bit easier, right, to, to make those connections. Well, in the Jewish culture, genealogies were extremely important. It, it helped them know what tribe they were from, what part of the family of God's chosen people were they a part of. And specifically, as we come to this text, the, the tribe of Judah and the line of David specifically of the tribe of Judah, a son of Jesse, keeps coming up in the Bible as a very important line, a very important family and generation to be aware of. And it was so important that the Jewish people were exhaustive in their record keeping of David's line. Because so much hinged, as we will see, on the promises that God had made to David, his servant. The covenant that God had made with David. So in Matthew chapter 1, which I'll read in a moment, we're going to see this connection to David's line. And why that's important for Jesus to be of David's family, a son of David. There are several things that I want you to notice as we read this. The first is that this genealogy, if you were to turn over to Luke chapter 3, Luke also provides a genealogy, which I referenced last week. But they, the focus of those genealogies are different. Luke goes all the way back and traces it back to Adam, like we saw last week, that to, to show that Jesus was a son of Adam. He was a true man, truly man, truly human, so that he could represent and redeem and save human beings from their sins. Well, Matthew's emphasis is on David specifically. He traces it back to David, and that is to show Jesus's royalty, his right to the throne, his right to God's promised kingdom. We also see this pattern of sevens or of 14. Uh, if you were to add the, the 14s up that you'll see in a second, you get 14 plus 14 plus 14. That's six sevens. And what you find out is that Jesus is the seventh of the sevens. He is the last and complete and perfect of the generations. And in a way, Matthew is trying to say, 
Jesus' kingdom, his lineage, his, his era is the last and greatest. It's the perfect, it's the complete, and it's the seventh Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is bringing our final and perfect rest. So have all those things in mind as I read for you this genealogy of Jesus from Matthew chapter 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asaph. And Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jotham. And Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. And Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, and Abiad, the father of Eliakim. And Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliad, and Eliad, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were fourteen generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and her husband Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the, as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Would you pray with me one more time? Father, as we come to this text, this passage, beholding your Son, Holy Spirit, would you help us? Help us to um, look at this with honest eyes, <clears throat> with a heart ready to receive your truth. And would you show us the significance of Jesus being the son of David, the, the rightful king to the throne. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I'm going to have to pop a mint in my mouth. Our family last week had uh, the cold stuff, and I've got that lingering dry throat thing going on. So my apologies. So what we're going to see this morning 
is that Jesus is the true king and his kingdom will last forever. <clears throat> We're going to see that in three points. If you have your worship guide, you can follow on the back of your worship guide and outline. First thing we'll see is that Jesus is the son of the royal family. <clears throat> Second thing we'll see is that his kingdom will grow and never end. And the third thing is that you can be a part of the royal family as well. So I want to point out several things from this passage. The first, when we think of Jesus being the son of the royal family, there's a lot of Old Testament um, history and background that comes with this, this theme of Jesus being the son of David. Now, for us, we don't have Jewish lineage, most of us, I would guess. Uh, so um, just the affiliation with David specifically might not seem very important to us right off the bat. You know, he's one earthly king of an earthly family in some place, regional area over in the Middle East. What significance does that have to do with me? Well, you have to understand that in the Old Testament, God made a covenant with his people. That covenant is that he would be their God and they would be his people. That there would be a relationship between this group of human beings and the God of the universe, the God of creation. And this was a, a special <coughs> and intimate and personal relationship that God was establishing with his people. And so the importance of that might pass us at first, but this was a significant thing for God's people. That he made a, a, a covenant with his servant David. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7 when God is having this conversation with David and he's making a covenant with him in 12 and 13 of that chapter. It says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this was the, the nature of the covenant that God made with David. He told him, I will establish a covenant with you, and I will bring a king after you who's going to come from your own body. This is a, a physical promise. He's going to be your biological offspring. He's going to be your son, hereditary son. And so he's going to come from your body. He's going to be of your line. And when I establish his throne, he will build a house for my name and his kingdom will last forever. Now, I think a lot of the <clears throat> Jews at the time were assuming that he was talking about his next son, Solomon. And then when Solomon's kingdom came, it was large. It was elaborate. It was wealthy. He built a house, a physical house for the Lord, the temple, and it was elaborate and everybody thought for sure Solomon's kingdom, this, this is the greatest kingdom in the world. Well, that kingdom didn't even last a generation after Solomon. It was split in half, or actually, you know, more than half, 10 twelfths, uh, or, or 5 six. if you're keeping up with fractions, everybody. Um, so, so, yeah, per, somebody do the percentage on that later if you want. All right, so 5 six of that kingdom was split, right? And only one-sixth of it remained somewhat faithful to God, the tribe of Judah, the people of Judah, the southern kingdom. And so, you know, they would have been like, wait, what, what about this covenant that God made? But then what you see in, in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles is they keep tracing the line of David with this sense of hope that God will keep his covenant with David. That, that one day God will come back and fulfill his promise. Well, then... You get the exile, that God's people are captured by enemies. They're taken into prison, they become prisoners and exiles in a foreign land. And at that point, it seems like this whole thing has dissolved. You can't see, uh, it was hard to trace, like, where's the line of David? We're not even on the throne anymore. We've been captured. And so actually it's during the exile period that 70 years, if you were here a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we tried to trace back over that, that history, right? If you, so it was during that period of 70 years, in the exile period, 
that most of the promises of this coming Messiah took place. And so I want to read for you a few of those things. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel was the first. I want to read for you from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 23 and 24. It says this, I will set up over them a shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David shall be prince among them. And then in chapter 37, he says this, My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. So the nature of his promise actually has to do with someone who is of the line of David who will be like another shepherd, right? David was a shepherd who became a king. Well, this coming king would also be a shepherd king. But the sheep weren't little literal animal sheep. It was the people of God. They were the sheep. And this shepherd that was coming would feed them, care for them, and be their prince forever. Psalm 89, which is an entire psalm, uh, probably most likely written during the exile period, has to do all about God's covenant faithfulness. And several verses in there say this. Um, it repeats God's promise. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. I have found David, my servant. I will not violate my covenant. I will not lie to David. Uh, I will. Uh, where, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? A throne will be established in steadfast love in faithfulness in the tent of David. So Psalm 89 is begging God to keep his promise that he made to David to, to set up this throne, this eternal kingdom, because of his promise to his servant David that his son would once again sit on the throne. And then Luke 1, uh, the, the story of when the angel appeared to Mary, Luke says it this way. Verse 32 of Luke 1, this son, you will bear a son, and he will be great, and will be called the son of the most high, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then in verse 68 and 70, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, is praying and worshiping God. He says this, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. So you see, for the Jewish people, this was a big deal. That God had made this promise to David. I'm sorry, I just have to grab one of these. Um, God had made a promise to his servant David, to the king, that he would establish a throne that David's son one day would have this kingdom that lasts forever. And so you see that throughout these promises about the shepherd, about a true king, about one who is the actual lineage and son of David. Now, people understood what this meant. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. People understood the significance of this. The Jewish people did, but also foreigners. So during the, right before the time of Jesus, when Jesus was born, there was a king there, Herod. You've heard of Herod in the story of Jesus, right? Herod the Great. Well, when Herod the Great took over the, the Jews and he became the king of the Jews, the earthly king of the Jews through the Roman government, he actually went into the temple and destroyed all of the genealogies he could find in the temple. Now, why would he do that? He was trying to erase any evidence of the line of David. So he understood there was significance in this promise. You see what I'm saying? This foreigner, and, and actually what's interesting is Herod was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau. So this goes all the way back to the story of Jacob and Esau, right? When Jacob stole the birthright from Esau. And so Herod, all the way down, he's trying to establish his kingdom and right to the throne. So what does he do? 
who tries to destroy any evidence that there's a line of David. Well, it turns out that there was this small town of 400 people where a lot of David's, uh, a lot of David's descendants lived. And they kept their own personal record, private record. They kept it hidden for generations in a small town called Nazareth. And it was in that town that a family of the line of David left one day to go to Bethlehem, to David's city, to, uh, to, for a census. Why? Because they were of the family of David. So you see where all the significance is in this, in this promise, in this family of David? And so the angel, when he appears to Joseph in this dream, he says, Joseph, son of David. And in this genealogy, it actually connects this to Joseph, the husband of Mary, um, who, who was the son of David. So what we see is that Jesus is a literal physical descendant of the royal family, and he is a rightful heir to the throne because he is a son of David. So that's the first thing. Jesus is the son of the royal family. The second thing is, because he is the son of David, and because he is the king that God has promised, his kingdom will last forever. He will he will establish his kingdom, and his kingdom will last forever. So in Jesus' ministry, you actually see the phrase or the term, the title come up over and over, son of David, son of David, son of David. And it's usually used by people who are very needy, who are very broken. Now, why would that be? It was because they were linking the promises that God had made to his people regarding the Messiah. When God made these promises about the Messiah, the coming Christ, one of the things he promised is that this Messiah would conquer the enemies and that he would restore his people and that he would bring healing in his wings. And so throughout the New Testament, if you read through, there's often these times when people cry out to Jesus from a, a place of desperation. One of the places we see that is in the triumphal entry. When Jesus enters in on the donkey, right? Your king will come riding on a donkey, the foal, the colt uh, of a donkey. So Jesus rides in on this donkey, and the people say what? They say, Hosanna, which means, please save us. That's what Hosanna means, son of David. What are they saying? If you're really our king, save us. Conquer our enemies. They, they recognized who Jesus was or, or who he was claiming to be. And they're saying, if this is really you, save us. Please save us. So there's the, the triumphal entry taking place. And then right after the triumphal entry, Jesus is in the temple and the Pharisees come up to him. And they, here's what it says in Matthew 22. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. So Jesus is asking the Pharisees, hey, you, you know about this Christ that was promised, right? Christ meaning anointed one or Messiah, anointed one, the, the anointed king, the coming king. Whose son is he? And they said, son of David. The Pharisees knew. They knew the promises. In that story of the triumphal entry, when the people were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, it says the Pharisees or, or the chief priests and scribes heard this and they became indignant. They became indignant and they said to Jesus, do you hear what these people are saying about you? Why? Because they knew what that term meant. To call this guy from Nazareth the son of David, they knew exactly the significance of that. And so that's why Jesus is the son of David, the promised king, the promised kingdom that he's bringing, which will grow and never end. Now, there's, a, there's an image that we read earlier from Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11 verse 1 talks about this 
shoot or this branch from the stump of Jesse. What is that talking about? Well, again, if you think about the kingdom of David, right, and the exile specifically, what does that look like? You've got this great kingdom, and they're conquered by enemies, and so it's, it's visually, it kinda, you can kind of picture this, right? The kingdom has been cut. It's been cut off. And so it's like a tree that's been topped off, right? It's, it's cut over, and all you've got is a stump. But I don't know if you've ever seen this before, where you cut a stump, and these branches grow out from it. Right, and I've actually done. I didn't do as much um, research on this. Uh, I'm I'm not a uh, you know I'm not a biologist, forester kind of guy at all. So I know we've got men out here who know more about this than I do. We actually have a guy that went to school for this. I just found out recently. So um, my apologies if I get this wrong. But a little bit of reading that I have done says when you have that stump in place and a branch grows out from it that branch has a lot of potential to become a very strong and even more sturdy tree because the roots from the previous tree are already established and they can suck in all the nutrients and water and life that is necessary to make that branch become a very strong and established tree. Now again, whether that's true or not, I'm sorry, but that's the visual I want you to have. That's what God is promising is from this stump that has been cut off, a branch will come out of that stump, the line of David, and this kingdom will grow and it will never end. It will be a strong kingdom. And so that's what God has promised. From the stump of Jesse, from Jesse's family, this kingdom will grow and it will never end. So Jesus' kingdom, that's what's happening, right? This is what Jesus actually said about his church. He said, I will build my church, and the, ge- the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's going to keep growing. And that's, that's what we as a church get to be a part of, right? When we see people come into church and hear the gospel and believe, that's another branch on the tree growing, right? And when that branch bears fruit, that's the tree, that's the kingdom growing. And that's the promise that Jesus has made to his people, to his church. And so Jesus is the king who is growing a kingdom that will never end. And then the last thing I want you to see is that this Jesus is a part of a royal family, and you can be a part of this royal family as well. Here's here's the really neat part about this whole covenant promise, is that through faith in Christ, you can actually be welcomed into this family as well. There's two different uh, visualizations we get of that in the Bible. The first is that you can become a part of this family by adoption. So by adoption, you can be welcomed into the family of God, and you can be um, taken in as a child of God by adoption. But then the other example we get is by marriage. That by marriage, you can become a part of the family of God. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus is called the bridegroom, right? He is the groom, and his church is the bride of Christ. Now, the reason I want to talk about that is if you go back in this lineage, you will see several names mentioned. You see someone by the name of Tamar. You see someone by the name of Rahab. You see someone by the name of Ruth, and then you, you don't see her name, but you see mentioned the wife of Uriah. Now, who are these women? These women are women who were welcomed into the family of God. Now, the first thing that's significant is in ancient genealogies, women weren't mentioned, right? In terms of genealogy and heritage, uh, that they focused on the male offspring, Okay. So women typically weren't mentioned in genealogies. Well, here we have four women mentioned, only four women. And who are these four women? Well, the first is Tamar. And I'm going to try to conceal some of the details of this for some of the younger children. But Tamar disguised herself as a prostitute. And her offspring were the result of her deception and and her... um, her promiscuity. So there's Tamar, 
an ancestor of Christ, part of his family. Then you have Rahab, who was also a prostitute, who was part of the, the city of Jericho that was destroyed by God, right? Enemies, outcast of God. And yet here's this Rahab, who by faith is welcomed into the family, who was a prostitute, who was redeemed and welcomed into the family, who then became a part of the royal family. You also have Ruth. Now, Ruth, the example of Ruth that we have is someone who is faithful, who has seen God as her God, your God will be my God, and, my, and your people my people. She had faith in this God. She believed that God was the true God. But she was a Moabitess. She was of a tribe that was not a, a part of the tribe of the Jews specifically. She was an outcast, an outsider, but one who is welcomed in by faith. And then you have... Um, the wife of Uriah, which is Bathsheba, who also was brought into the family because of David's sin. And so what do, what do we learn about all these women? Well, we learn that Jesus' family consists of a lot of sinners. And that sinners can be a part of the royal family by faith. And so... Whatever you've done and wherever you've been, you can be a part of Jesus' family if you come to him by faith. If you come to him in repentance, trusting him that he is the king, that he is the Christ who came to suffer and live and die for sinners, and that by faith you can be accepted by him. Jesus' family is a family that welcomes sinners. And so in Luke chapter 2, when the angels come and they are announcing this message to the shepherds, here's what they say to them. The angel said to him, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all. All people, all kinds of people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And then the angels, a great multitude appeared, and the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. So the story of Christmas is that we have a king, and we have a king who welcomes sinners into his royal family, that by faith, wherever you have been and whatever you have done, you can come to him in repentance and faith and be welcomed into his family. Now, every time I look at or read or hear Luke chapter 2, I think of Linus. Y'all know who I'm talking about? From the Charlie Brown Christmas. I don't know if you've seen that recently or if you've seen that before. But Linus is a character in there who has, who, who's constantly carrying around a blanket. You know what I'm talking about? He carries around this blanket. He's attached to that blanket. That blanket is literally a security blanket for him, right? He has to have it wherever he goes. And I don't know if you've ever picked up on this before, but Linus in the story of uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas, at one point, Charlie Brown just gets so frustrated. There's all these people talking about, you know, what Christmas is about. It's about gifts. It's about this. It's about that. And Charlie Brown gets so frustrated, and he says, can somebody tell me what Christmas is really all about? And then the lights go dark. The spotlight appears on the stage, and there's Linus, right? And he says, I'll tell you what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. And what does he do? He quotes Luke chapter 2. And he starts reading through. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the line shone round them, and they were filled with great fear. Their, their version's a little bit different, right? But then when he's up there on the stage, he's got his security blanket, and he's, re he's quoting this, and at one point he says, Fear not, right? Fear not, for behold, I bring you great news of great joy. In that moment... Go back and watch this this year. He dropped his blanket. 
He says, fear not, and drops the blanket and leaves it sitting on the stage. And he finishes the story of Jesus. I, there's a lot of significance in that moment, isn't there? That because Jesus has come, he's brought peace that, that we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear what people think about us. We don't have to fear what people might do to us. But our king has come. He's a good shepherd. And he is taking care of us, watching over us, saving us, and loving us. And so it's later in the movie when Charlie Brown needs help, right? He's got this tree. It's a puny little tree. And they put the ball on top and it droops over. And who's the first one that comes to help? It's Linus. And what does he do to help? He gives away his blanket. He takes this thing that he's been so attached to and he's willing to sacrifice it for the sake of his friend, to help his friend. And I think there's so much significance in that, that in this Christmas season, because Jesus has come to us, the only way we're going to be able to give to others and help others and serve others and be generous with others is if we recognize the generosity of Christ to us. That we see Christ has provided everything I need so I can help people with my stuff. I can sacrifice my stuff that I love because Jesus has come to serve and to save and to give his life for me. That's part of the story of Christmas, isn't it? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are the son of David. You are the king who has come and established his kingdom forever. We pray that you would help us see the true meaning of Christmas and be encouraged, have great joy and peace that we would not fear because you are king and savior of your people. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.